How are you all today? Excellent. Before we begin, I'd like to take a quick moment to make an announcement that the uh, Navy's newest San Antonio class amphibious transport dock ship will be named after Medal of Honor winner Captain Richard M. McCool, Jr., United States Navy. Uh, Captain McCool is a unique person in that he, uh, he served in the trifecta, World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam. He was presented the Medal of Honor for his bravery under fire during the Battle of Okinawa. And I believe this ship serves as a real testimony and a testament to our commitment of growing the fleet uh, and our partnership with America. Uh, we definitely look forward to laying keel and getting this ship out onto the high seas. Ladies and gentlemen, here today, and I want to thank you for coming uh, to hear about the state of the, your Department of the Navy. I'm here with uh, two people that I want to tell you over the last nine months have truly become business partners as we face the challenges and the requirements of Title X, uh, General uh, uh, Neller and Admiral Richardson. A few months ago, as you all know, Congress reached a bipartisan agreement that addressed the president's budget request. Um, we are very much aware that it stretched everyone to the limits of comfort, uh, but it shows that we really can accomplish goals when needed. I will tell you that we will smartly walk out on uh, allocating those resources appropriated by Congress, and we'll focus that in alignment, as you will see, with the national defense strategy. As we're here before you today, 94,000 sailors and Marines are deployed around the globe, ensuring maritime lanes of commerce remain free and open, ensuring the access to global commons, and protecting American citizens abroad and protecting our national interests. They're on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They depend on and appreciate the full support of Americans as they fulfill their duty. As directed by the 2018 National Defense Strategy, we're building a model of a more lethal, resilient, and agile force capable of deterring and defeating any enemy in this age of, as we know it, renewed power competition. We're determined to increase our competitive advantage over our adversaries by focusing on people, capabilities, and process. The ability to accomplish our mission relies on people. Over 800,000 sailors and Marines, both active duty and reserve, our civilian teammates and their families comprise this team. We'll continue to build a more lethal, agile, talented, and innovative workforce as we go forward. We will recruit, train, and retain the best we have in our bin of where we're fishing, pardon me. Our people are the foundation of everything we do, so we're committed, absolutely committed to building the strongest foundation possible. Along with having the best war fighters in the world, we must also continue to provide them the capabilities and capacities needed to fight tonight. We're investing in modernization of key capabilities, new technologies every single day. We're building the Navy the nation needs and the Marine Corps of the future. We're building a more lethal and ready Navy Marine Corps team by focusing on process improvement. We'll ensure that our processes are value-add and efficiently supporting our warfighter as our core competency. We are internalizing the lessons learned across all facets of the naval enterprise as we refine our processes going forward. We'll use every acquisition authority given to us by Congress to grow this Navy Marine Corps team. We're working in partnership with industry to deliver maximum efficiency and value to the American taxpayers. Ladies and gentlemen, the Department of Navy is ready, able, and lethal. We're working with a sense of urgency. My team and I are committed to continuing to deliver combat-ready forces capable of meeting and defeating the challenges of today and tomorrow. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, General Miller, um, about a little over a year ago, we saw you, and you were talking about the Marines United uh, scandal that had hit the Marine Corps. Um, last week, there, um, we found that there has been an increase in sexual assaults in the Marine Corps. I was wondering if you could talk about the last year, what changes, what improvements, or what has the Marine Corps done to address these problems, and do you think enough has been done? What more do you think you have to do to get at this? I appreciate you reminding me about the last time I was in this room. Um, so after the events um, and the hearings and all that and the article, 
we formed a task force because we recognized that we had some informational issues, we had some policy issues, and we had to make sure that everybody understood what the what the rules of the road were. So that task force remains in effect. Um, we don't have the ability nor the legal authority to monitor social media, but you know, from me going out and talking to thousands of Marines and telling them what had happened and what the expectation of the American people is for them as U.S. Marines to making every Marine from myself down to every Marine who joins sign a what we call a page 11 or something administrative in your record book that you acknowledge that you've read the policy and you know what the rules are. Therefore, if you violate those rules, you're potentially subject to a violation of the UCMJ, to talking to different groups, to making sure the commanders understood what their responsibilities were, to change in fourth phase of recruit training, to give young Marines some time to practice being Marines before they got out there. So I could go on. So when I was briefed the other day by the OSD task force on sexual assault, obviously we were aware that we had had a slight increase over the previous year. And you have to decide what are the metrics you're going to measure improvement. So they were actually saying, hey, this is good that more people are reporting. Because to me, the metric is do, do Marines have confidence in their chain of command? And do they believe that the potential for retribution goes down? So that's what we're trying to measure. So are we where we want to be? No. Um, if that number continues to go up, then I have to decide, we have to decide if that's because we, are, we still can't improve our behavior and our discipline or it's because people are reporting because by all accounts, everyone believes it's a well underreported event. So am I happy where we are? It's been a year. I mean, we were trying to change um, a culture that didn't start a year ago, and social media is something that's across the country. I'm not responsible for the rest of the country, but I think we should all be concerned with, with some of the negative things that happen on social media. So we continue to monitor. We still continue to pay attention. We and continue to hold people accountable, no matter what their rank or status is. And that's the bottom line. We're all accountable. And uh, if we're aware of an allegation, we're going to investigate it. And if it's substantiated, the individuals involved will be held accountable. I'm going to add a punctuation on that because I think this is a tremendously important issue. Uh, having been here only for nine months, I can tell you that uh, we do hold ourselves in a higher level than, than the American public because we are the military that uh, represents the country going forward. But having seen the resources and, and the products that we have in place to battle this cancerous issue, uh, I will entertain sharing that with any college, university, or company that wants to see what we're doing because I believe we have one of the best products out there. Can I just, uh, just a quick follow-up. Do you know if either the Navy or the Marine Corps has um, disciplined anyone under the new social media policies that, that were put together last year? Yes. I can get you the numbers. Um, but, I mean, this isn't about, you know, counting coup or hanging scalps. I mean, it's what you want to make people understand is, hey, look, this is about respect. It's about recognition of, of uh, a Marine as a Marine. Uh, you're, you're evaluated based on your performance as a Marine. But just in the in the civil world, you know, there are behaviors that are going on out there that trans sometimes we recruit from the American people. And we have to teach people that there's a we have a different standard for your behavior and your conduct. And if they don't understand it, then they're gonna have to be held accountable and if necessary they're gonna leave. Yeah, I'll just jump onto that. Same thing with the Navy. It's really uh, you know the, the accountability part is certainly one of the aspects of this, but there, there is a cultural change that we're trying to create where it, you're going to depend on your teammate, your shipmate for your life. That's the thing that uh, should really drive behavior, mutual respect. Uh, we've really aimed our signature behavior program at the uh, small unit level, small unit leaders. That's where we think there's going to be uh, potential for a lot of progress. And so that's, you know, just completely support where the Commandant's approach there. Dude. <coughs> Thanks, Captain. Uh, so last week, Vice Admiral Ockoin raised some issues in a proceedings article uh, concerning the CR and SR and some of the shortcomings that he felt uh, uh, weren't adequately addressed. So I don't want to raise those concerns here, but what I do want to ask is 
Um, setting aside the concerns, what does it say about the system that your leaders seem to operate under uh, if they feel like they have to wait until their retirement grade determination to speak out about issues like this that they care about? It feels like if there were issues that weren't addressed by the CR or the SR, or SRR, that his input and perhaps input earlier on might have led something, but it doesn't, doesn't seem like he did until he waited until his retirement. Let, let me answer your question, then I'll also uh, have the CNO weigh in if he desires. Um, if you've heard my three priorities, they're people, capabilities, and process. And if you've heard me make any of my presentations under people, people who are facing off issues have the best solutions. They should bring them forward. That is the standard that we're operating under right now. Um, the fact of the matter is everyone has responsibilities to do what they can within their areas of, of responsibility, and we expect people to affect that. I think I see it the same way. There's nothing I, that I'm aware of that would have prohibited him from speaking up. In fact, uh, you know, he had plenty of opportunity when he was in command. Uh, you know, we read that article, and uh, really there wasn't a whole lot new that isn't covered by the uh, CR and SRR, and so I think we're in a pretty good spot there. Do you think the culture somehow limits or discourages senior officers from speaking out uh, publicly, at the very least, about issues like this? No, I don't think so. Not at all. Yes, I thank you gentlemen very much for giving this presentation. And my question has to do with the long war that this country's been in since 9-11. And it's specifically a question for General Neller. How do you under we've been fighting this war now 17 years, long time. How do you understand the enemy that we're fighting, we call it radical Islam or the global jihad? Do you see, people tend to think of it as one Islamic or a few Islamic characters and their crazy followers, but do you see intelligence agencies involved in that? And specifically, are intelligence agencies involved in radical Islam, using and covertly supporting these people? And specifically in regards to ISIS, there was a, a very interesting article in the German magazine Der Spiegel about three years ago, which argued that, which, which said that the core of ISIS is the former Iraqi regime with this Islamic overlay. Is that something you would agree with or you have a different perspective? I left Iraq in 2007 and Clearly, the, the ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Iraq that we fought there did include former Saddam personnel. I can't tell you what, the, what it is now. And, and I, I don't think it, it's not this. I mean, I, I think you got to look by country by country. What's going on in the Philippines? What's going on in Afghanistan? What's going on in Iraq? What's going on in Yemen? What's going on in Somalia? What's going on in Nigeria, Libya, Chad, Niger, Syria? Europe, it's not this, there's not a single, you know, thing other than them, whoever these people are, whether they're criminals, whether they are believers, that they use Islam as, you know, Islam is being violated, that's my personal opinion, and that therefore you should come and help us because you're, you know, you're not being given the opportunity to worship or whatever, or your land's being occupied. So, at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's very interesting. And all I know is, based on the information that we see, there's people out there that want to come to this country and hurt us. Do you think if the United States did more in terms of its information operations and the way it presents this, this threat, say, regarding ISIS, to emphasize that there are former Iraqi regime officials involved, and if you say you live in France and you go join ISIS, you are in fact cannon fodder for these former Iraqi regime elements, that that would be a good approach I to I think that people are already, I think, I'm not going to, I don't know what the French information policy is or the German information or the Italian or the Spanish or the Belgian, who all have significant uh, populations that came from this part of the world. But I believe they all use that as a say, hey, look, you, these people are not telling you the truth. You're not going to go there. And many people that have come back have publicly stated that. And they're on the news and they're saying, hey, you, this is not a true story. You're not there. This, this, they're using Islam to, to deceive you and take advantage of you. So I believe that's happening. 
but we also have to have, have if you're going to be on, inform, on the information highway, you have to have something that somebody's going to read. We've all, we as Americans, we've tried very, very hard to message the populations to tell them, you know, what we believe is to their advantage that, is, that we're not there. We don't want their land. We're not going to stay. We're not there to take anything. We're here to give you an opportunity to live in peace. But they have to be able to believe that, and there's always a counter narrative. So the information fight goes on every day, and we're continuing to try to be as effective as we can in that in space. Uh, we're probably going to have a hard time being as effective as we would like, but we're still fighting that fight. This is uh, for Admiral Richardson and also the Secretary. Uh, Admiral, back in November after the ship accidents in the Pacific, you were asked, are you worried there were too many officers out there in the fleet who simply don't know how to drive a ship? And you said, we're doing these ready for sea assessments to determine that exactly. So six months later, what have you learned from these assessments? Uh, are there any problems uh, uh, with the basics? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, whenever you look at something this close, you always see areas of improvement, right, and it's for improvement. And I think that the uh, steps and the measures laid out in what is sort of a comprehensive plan that includes not only the uh, results from and recommendations from the individual investigations into each one of those incidents, but also the systemic in investigation we did by virtue of the comprehensive review, and then the strategic readiness review that the secretary did. We also rolled in all of the uh, GAO reports and you know, pretty much everything that we could get our arms around into a, a single comprehensive plan. When you look at all of that, there's always ways that you can improve. So we're looking at individual training over the course of the career of those uh, surface warfare officers. We're looking, at, and that starts with you know their initial basic course, uh, looking to uh, improve that uh, through more, um, I guess, uh, challenging uh, scenarios and simulators, give them more chance to drive. And that goes up through command, right? And with increasing uh, levels of difficulty and also increasingly levels of increasingly difficult assessments along the way. Uh, as well, we're also looking in the fleet concentration areas to uh, supplement that individual training with team training, right? So you get a chance to see how that particular bridge team operates. And so, uh, you're always going to sort of see ways you can uh, improve. Uh, th this is exactly along those lines. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, the fleets, uh, with uh, the uh, private sector and th those folks who can provide that technology, and also the Congress to make sure that we uh, get the uh, funding to do that through the, the fit ups. So. you find any common problems, common themes in any of these shortfalls or training? What, what exactly was it? Were they getting to the ship too early before they were actually well trained? I think that we found that, uh, yeah, I think we could find, we found that we could do a little bit more in terms of giving them some basic ship driving uh, skills uh, before they report as a junior officer. Why wasn't we, that done then? What's that? Why wasn't that done? Well, it's, a, it's a, what do you mean? It's being basic done right ship now. Driving. But, well, you know, it's like I said, every time you look, you, you look for areas where you can improve, and we found some. I mean, it's not like we hadn't uh, looked at that and had done an assessment. At that time, we thought what we were doing was uh, appropriate. Uh, since then, we've learned that we could probably do a little bit more. Technologies advanced, those sorts of things. And so it's really this, uh, this spirit of continuing improvement and opportunity that we're looking at. Yeah, sure. If you look at uh, what the uh, CNO just said about what we corralled in to look at, it was 140 or so recommendations, observations, steerage. Uh, we think we uh, boiled it down to about 110 or so, the 111 that we wanted to actually enact. We've enacted 20 of them, 78 percent. These are not, uh, a lot of them uh, are immediate uh, uh, remedies, but uh, just to make sure we manage expectations, a lot of these are cultural shifts, and one of them is the continuing learning that we really have to culturally get at. This isn't a one-time, wow, now we're going to have someone drive a ship for five hours before they show up. This is going to be, wow, let's start with five. Maybe it goes down to four. Maybe it goes up to eight. We're going to continually be in the learning process of what we can do to correct the root causes. Uh, thank you. A question for each of the Joint Chiefs, if I could, please. Uh, Admiral, uh, we've, we've seen some pretty ugly allegations on uh, Rear Admiral Jackson over the last couple weeks. A lot of it's not substantiated at this point. Um, and Secretary Mattis suggested that the IG might look at what to do with this over the last couple of days. Uh, from a Navy perspective, do you see yourself referring this to Navy IG? And for uh, the general, please. Um, there's a new book out, and there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of years 
uh, that kind of debate whether or not to fully gender integrate uh, Paris Island. Uh, where do you stand on that at this point? I mean, is there any, any thought of changing things up or further integrating where we are now? I guess I'll go first. Uh, the way that this happens by virtue of Admiral Jackson being a flag officer, the default organization would be DODIG to look at those. And so we're at the beginning stages of getting that done. We train our recruits by platoons. And there's a federal statute that says you live with your same gender. Our drill instructors stay with their recruits 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the entire time they're there. So I'm not considering having men and women live together in an open squad bay. And I'm not considering having Marine recruits fall out and go from one platoon to another. We train by platoon. So if you want to come down to Paris Island, I will show you that after the first phase of training, which lasts about three weeks, male and female platoons do almost 65 to 70 percent of their training together, whether it be the rifle range, whether it be swim qualification, whether it be their fitness tests, whether it be going to the battle skills training at the field training division, whether it be the crucible and the last now fourth phase where they're actually sitting in classroom where we will have them sitting next to each other because that's what happens the rest of the time. So we do this because this, we, this is the way we believe is the most effective way to make Marines. We don't do it in any other reason. We don't do it to disadvantage women. And quite frankly, we do it to advantage women. We want them focused on learning how to be a Marine. And so to answer your question, am I considering any changes right now? No. Uh, I have another CR and SRR question for you too. Um, one of the issues that came up was the length of time that some of the ships had spent for deployed in the FDNF fleet. Uh, I understand that about half of them have been there longer than 10 years and one as long as 23 years. So I was wondering in the aftermath of both of those reports, how you guys are looking at potentially bringing some of those ships back stateside, kind of what the readiness concerns are, and um, also if you could just update generally on the CR and SRR implementation. Sure. Uh, we had already decided before the CR and SRR early last year that, uh, you know, that uh, that plan was starting to show some uh, weaknesses already. So we'd already decided to rotate them back, Megan, in terms of uh, about every eight years. So nobody will be deployed. Now, it'll take us some time to transition into that so that we get onto this eight-year cycle, but we'll do that as briskly as possible. And we were really seeing that uh, some of the deep maintenance issues were, uh, were having trouble uh, addressing those at uh, the SRF and UQC. So they're absolutely superb uh, work, work Work, working team, you know, but uh, just it's hard to get into the, some of the deeper maintenance. Is there a plan in place to get those older ships back? There is, yeah. Okay. There is. Joe Tampion. Admiral Richardson, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you, how do you assess uh, Iran's uh, uh, behavior in the Persian Gulf in the recent month, month? Have you seen any unsafe, unprofessional actions by the Iranian Navy? And We've seen generally fewer uh, provocative actions by uh, the Iranians in the Persian Gulf uh, recently. This is in the last few months, or it's in the yeah last six months or so. All right, thank you. Thanks, uh, sir. The Pentagon today announced that they was going to ban mobile phones from two Chinese companies. What were your recommendations on this, and why did you make those recommendations? Well, the mobile phone ban was more due to uh, location devices than anything else, the ability to be located. Uh, I think you probably heard the story that uh, concerning uh, Chinese manufacturers that we talked about uh, during the uh, testimony period, which was a contract that we let that we put a hold on. Uh, that addresses more Chinese manufacturers than it does the cell phone uh, issue, but it's yeah. more a location device concern so and a listening device so concern. Would it be fair to extrapolate the the idea that perhaps there's other devices like this, it's not necessarily Chinese uh, companies, but devices generally, uh, they, we talked about Fitbit earlier here in the Pentagon, there hasn't been a decision on, on that, but generally throughout the, would that be a fair? That would be a fair assessment. Okay, thank you. Up on Joe's question um, in regards to Iranian activity, uh, what do you attribute? To, what do you attribute that drop to? Do you think is it a cause of the current debate that's going on regarding the nuclear deal? Are there other issues at play here? Why you're seeing 
this sort of drop? And I have a second a follow-up question for a general. You know, it'd be pure speculation, and so I just respond to the behavior that I see. General Miller, um, uh, regards to Afghanistan, with um, the annual fighting season about to start, uh, your forces in uh, southern Afghanistan, there were some incidents this week. Um, what's your sort of take on how you sort of see things playing out under the new strategy by the White House, and uh, you know what sort of measures can be taken on the ground to sort of implement that more effectively? I don't like talking about the Marines in Afghanistan because I don't want to draw any more attention to them because you and I know they've been, they've been reasonably effective tactically. But so, but that's, that's a small part of it. I mean, at the end of the day, back to the long war discussion, there's going to have to be a political settlement. And all the efforts to reconcile with the Taliban through the Afghan government, I, f I think we all fully support because at the end of the day, you know, they're fighting us, they have their agenda, we're there to support the Afghan government, and they're going to have to be convinced or decide on their own that there's a better way to do this. I mean, they've been fighting, what, 40 years? And so, we're hopeful that, you know, we can support the Afghan military and the governor and, and Hellman and the local police and the national police and that we can create a secure environment so that the Afghans can have an election and that possibly there'll be enough, there'll be a, a significant enough program so that those Taliban uh, who think there might be a better way to live their lives and continue to have their young men get killed. Uh, being led by people that aren't even there in the fight, they live in other countries, and that are convincing them that this is the right thing to do when really all they're doing is making money on drugs. I mean, we talk about, you know, the, the, uh, the terrorists call themselves, you know, they're the freedom fighters, they're the Mujahideen. They're not. They're criminals. I think the uh, Arabic word is takfiri. They're apostates. They hide behind Islam. They sell drugs. They kill innocent people. That's not what Islam is. The Afghan army and, and the American, we're the, we're the Mujahideen. We're the Mujahideen. That's the message. And maybe they'll get tired of this and they'll decide that there's a better way and then we can move on to something else. Um, we recently did an in-depth look at the aviation accidents across the services, and the Navy and the Marine Corps really bore the brunt of the, the biggest increases in accidents. After that, we heard from multiple families that were concerned that both, both the Navy and Marine Corps continue to put their aviators in the air <coughs> uh, without the proper flight training hours with you know aircraft that aren't fully ready. Um, what can you say to those families that uh, really wonder if there's a can't say no you know, culture in both the Navy and the Marine Corps that continues to send aviators out even if they're not ready or their aircraft aren't ready? I'll speak for the Navy. We don't, they're, they're, these are controlled by strict regulations. Uh, we're not violating any of those regulations. Uh, those aircraft that we send pilots up in are fully certified to fly. <clears throat> the pilots that are, we send in to fly them are cert fully certified for the missions that they uh, conduct. And so uh, now, you know, we have been uh, adjusting flight hours. Those are back on the rise, <clears throat> not with the increased readiness, but we're not, we're not sending uh, people into the air in aircraft or pilots that are unprepared for the missions that they take. And let's look at the data. The data that you're talking about accidents include A, Bs, and Cs. A's is not that. We look at five-year average. We're not out of the norm at all. C's were up. Is that a leading indicator that we should be looking at? Most definitely. C's being the more minor. C's, uh, I'm taking for granted. You No, yes, exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a dollar way to lower the, the least amount of damage, uh, towing accidents, things like that. Uh, I can only reverberate uh, what the CNO said when it comes to training and requirements. We're flying more, so we can't get better if we don't fly more. Um, the aircraft we're flying, they've been certified and they're ready to go. We're not flying aircraft that aren't safe, and if there's an issue, you know, there's a procedure that they're trained to do to try to get to a safe place. And we've had a number of precautionary landings, 
and that's what I expect them to do. I'd rather have a precautionary landing than a, a mishap. So, but, so that I can show you the numbers are up, the body model, model type series, and there was a story out there today that that's just the forward deployed forces. It's not. I went back and checked. Actually, the home station forces are flying, in some cases, more than the forward deployed forces. So, and why is that? Well, because for the last two years, we finally got sustained, consistent funding, and we got a part stream. The number one reason aircraft are not ready is because they're short parts. And now we're starting to get the parts. And so we're in the middle of, tra the Marine Corps is in the middle of transitioning every model type series aircraft we have. So there's a training period and you're flying a new airplane, except the CH-53, which hopefully will transition to the K here in the next couple of years. So we know we need to fly more. We know we need to have a consistent part support. And we're working through all that. So last year we had a horrible year. We had a horrible year. And my heart goes out to the families that lost uh, a Marine. In one case, we had a sailor and 15 Marines on a C-130. And those families were all brief. They were told the reason, uh, what we believe happened in that particular mishap, just like the families were told in every other mishap we had where we lost a life. And some, you know, like the 53 we had at El Centro the other day, we don't know yet. We've recovered what we could of the airplane. We got in a hangar at Miramar, and we're trying to figure out what happened. But uh, and so we're trying to get it, we're trying to get better. We're trying to improve. We're trying to fly more, and right now we're doing that. And so uh, we're we're being as safe as we can. As the secretary and the CNO mentioned, Class C is the kind of minor stuff uh, that doesn't cause a, normally doesn't cause uh, cause loss of life. Uh, that's reducing the number of airplanes we have. That's the stuff we got to fix too, because we want to be able to fly more. Because if we fly more, we should become more skilled, and we should have fewer Class A's. But just to make sure that you all understand something here, filling up a part bin does not happen in one fiscal year cycle. We need to send a signal to industry that we need the parts on a consistent basis, so they make the investments to make the parts. And that's the most important takeaway here: is we have to have consistent funding. Uh, to do our mission in the most effective and efficient manner. Yeah, uh, General, if I could just follow that. You mentioned the, the KC-130 from last year. Today there's another C-130 that crashed. It was an Air Force asset. In general, can we attribute this uptick in accidents to a lack of funding? We hear that a lot on Capitol Hill, and I understand that some of these investigations are ongoing, especially all these helicopters that we, we lost in March and April. What's the correlation there, and can you sort of lay it out, what you guys think the lack of funding has to do with it. Uh, I'll, I'll go first here and then defer, obviously, to CNO and CMC. But um, there is not enough data right now to tell you that there's an exact correlation. Uh, I will make the observation that, uh, one, we are training people to the requirements necessary. Those additive hours that people have in the cockpit or doing their jobs are only going to help. So now we have the funds to do that. Uh, but that's kind of a brilliant flash of the obvious comment. I don't have data to give you a direct correlation. I mean, I, I'm not going to correlate. I, I don't know what there's, – there's two versions of the C-130. I don't know what it was. I don't know what happened. I'm not going to speculate. I think we have a pretty good idea what happened to our airplane last year. Uh, in that particular case, I'm not sure funding would have – change the outcome, and I'm not going to talk about it because the family's just been informed and actually we're coming up on the anniversary of that. And so, uh, but that was a, a mechanical issue. But, but in general, you see, you guys are saying that there's really no link between the, because we hear this on Capitol Hill all the time, that it's the lack of funding that's causing these accidents. And you guys are saying here there isn't the data. No, I think, I think the funding is affecting the number of airplanes that are ready and the number of hours we can fly. So, you know, we've been at this. I mean, we didn't. This just didn't happen overnight. And so, we, when when was the budget control? I'm not going to blame anybody on this, but we went to BCA what 20, 30, 20, 12, 2011. 2011. So we've been on CR eight out of the last nine years, and we got a government shutdown. And we didn't, we we didn't fund aviation readiness to the amount that we probably should have because we the money was there was we were in this kind of financial. Uh, fiscal reduction, okay, there were decisions that were made. So, you know, we've got a backlog of, of maintenance. We've got airplanes now coming out of depot. 
Uh, the secretary went down there. There were some things going on at the depot where we were getting the airplane back, and it wasn't in a position where it could fly. And now we've corrected that, but we that costs that costs some money. <laughs> and so, and we're buying new airplanes. And so the new airplanes has a higher level of readiness. I mean, it's not a single thing. And and for pilots, if you've been a pilot, you know, 20 years ago, if you were a, a senior captain or a major, you probably had, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 hours. People that are senior captains or majors now, they probably got 800 hours. So there's not, there's not one single thing. There's not one single thing that's the, you can't say it's because of this. And, there's, and so we're looking at all these different things. We need more hours, we need better parts support, we need new airplanes, uh, we gotta improve our procedures, and we gotta stop doing stuff on the ground that, that causes us to lose otherwise perfectly good airplanes. And we need to train, and it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous business. Uh, I'm Richardson. Uh, the U.S. has a significant naval presence in Mediterranean, and also the tensions around Mediterranean is increasing. As you have seen, there is an escalating tension between Israel and Iran inside Western Syria, and there is a, also a tension between the Turks and Greeks around Cyprus. So to what extent are you concerned that you might be caught up in a active conflict between Iran and Syria in Western, uh, Iran and Israel in Western Syria and then it's below effect to you and also to the, 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 the tension between the Turks and uh, uh, Greeks around in, in Cyprus. Yeah, well the Turks and Greeks situation is nothing new I don't think and so we've been, uh, you know, even inside of NATO, it's, some, it's a dynamic that uh, always needs attention. Uh, but there is an increasing activity, and uh, I would agree with you, some increasing tension in the eastern Mediterranean. It's one of the new dynamics in this, uh, the, the situation that the national defense strategy talks about in terms of a, a great power competition. This is one of those manifestations. And so uh, it, we're watching that very closely. Uh, by and large, the uh, interactions between the United States and foreign vessels have been uh, safe and professional. Uh, we want to make sure that we have these operational constructs in place to keep it that way uh, as, as things, you know, get, as you get more activity and potentially more tension, just want to make sure we're minimizing the uh, opportunity or the risk of miscalculation. There were reports earlier saying that the Navy is no longer going to announce when it fires its commanders. I'm wondering, Admiral, if you can walk us through your thinking on that. Yeah, you know, I don't think that in the practice much is going to change. I think that's being overblown uh, quite a bit. Uh, the thing that we value most of all is uh, our relationship of trust and confidence, both within the ranks and, you know, we have uh, our sailors are part of that audience, and then certainly with the American people as well. And so the, we wouldn't do anything to uh, jeopardize that uh, that relationship of trust and confidence. And so I think there's, you know, perhaps being more made of that than. Uh, than you'll see in practice. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, to Admiral and uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a year since uh, the replacement facility construction finally started. So how do you, uh, when do you expect the construction is going to be over? And at the same time, uh, FY18 budget boosts the ground build-up. So well, when is the estimate due to start uh, relocation and uh, relocating Marines from Okinawa to Guam. Okay, I'll, I'll defer to the Commandant on that. Thank you. <laughs> I'd well, be happy to answer the, the question Fatema, about the Marines, the but I don't The Fatema <laughs> replacement facility has been delayed off and on because of a number of things, because of uh, discussions between the, the Japanese government and the, gov the prefecture of Okinawa and the efforts of the, the governor to, uh, and he's, I understand he's not well, Governor Onaga, I wish him a speedy recovery. Um, so there have been environmental issues, there have been other legal issues, there have been approval of landfill permits, but I believe that those things are finally resolved. And so when I was there earlier this year, you could see that the work was ongoing. There are still demonstrators there. So that will go on. And now there's, we've had other issues in uh, the Commonwealth of the Marianas in the, in the training area because part of the understanding is Marines would go, to, would go to Guam if they were able to train and there are still some pending environmental issues there. So that said, the bottom line is uh, the agreement that we're going to reduce the number of Marines on Okinawa 
that the Fatema replacement facility is going to be built at Schwab, that Marines are going to go to Guam, uh, still remains the plan. And the timeline obviously has slipped to the right, but we're committed to the plan in those principles, and we're finally starting to see a little bit of progress. So as far as when the numbers will go down, it will depend on when there's facilities and training facilities for those Marines to use and occupy in Guam. The Fatema replacement facility is going to take a while. It's following up, but how do you ensure uh, you, 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 need, you need to use uh, Fatema until the construction is going to be done? So how do you ensure the safety issues of Fatema Air, Air Base? Well, the Japanese government, Fatema Air Base is very old. It goes back to World War II. And if you look at pictures, Fatema, when it was built, was there were no, no people living within several kilometers. Now the cities around Fatema are right up to the fence. So it would be helpful if the people that lived around there didn't uh, point lasers at our airplanes or fly kites or balloons into flight paths because that way we would have a better assurance that they would be safe. But we want everybody to be safe. We're there because of a treaty with the government of Japan to assure the defense of, the, of Japan. And so uh, we're, we're, we are happy to leave Fatema when we have a place to leave to go to. Until then, we'll continue to operate and be as safe as we can. And that's why if our, our air crews know that if they have a problem, they're instructed to land in a safe place, secure their airplane, and then we'll fix the airplane if there's a problem. And so I would, I would ask the Okinawan people to understand that we're doing this for the safety of our air crew and for their safety, and they should be a and I would ask their consideration. I know I've lived on Okinawa before with my family, and I know the great majority of Okinawan people appreciate the American presence there and that the great, great majority of us are good neighbors and we're good friends and we'll continue to do our very best to be good neighbors throughout Japan. Last question, Kevin. Thank you. Hopefully a quick one on uh, transgender. Since the policy was changed at OSD, we've heard from, uh, I think, all of the, of the Joint Chiefs some different, I'll paraphrase, version of, you know what, we, there, was, there were no problems with trans transgender troops to unit cohesion or to the mission. And so there's been some commentary recently that, that suggests there, there was, that the OSD did not take the recommendations of the Chiefs on that issue. Uh, I was wondering if you wanted to address those, you know, that commentary. Is that accurate? It was, is there another way to characterize it from your perspective? I think we've been fairly unwavering in our fact that uh, any patriot that wants to serve and qualifies under the requirements that are at hand has a place in our services. Uh, right now, uh, we have a legal system in place uh, that is entertaining all the arguments, and until those arguments are concluded, uh, really, I don't have anything else to address in that regard. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.